Snap Studios. At Radio Lab, we love nothing more than nerding out about science, neuroscience, chemistry. But but we do also like to get into other kinds of stories. Stories about policing or politics, country music, hockey, sex of bugs. <laughs> Regardless of whether we're looking at science or not science, we bring a rigorous curiosity to get you the answers. And hopefully make you see the world anew. Radio Lab adventures on the edge of what we think we know. Wherever you get your podcasts. Snap Judgment is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. You chose to hit play on this podcast today. Smart choice. Make another smart choice with AutoQuote Explorer to compare rates from multiple car insurance companies all at once. Try it at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. If you love iPhone, you'll love Apple Card. It comes with the privacy and security you expect from Apple. Plus, you earn up to 3% daily cash back on every purchase, which can automatically earn interest when you open a high-yield savings account through Apple Card. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app. Subject to credit approval, savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Apple Card and savings by Goldman Sachs Bank USA. Salt Lake City Branch, member FDIC. Terms and more at AppleCard.com. So I'm just walking down the street, minding my own business, bright sunny day. Then I feel something hit me on the back of the head. Hey! And my feet appears to be a chicken bone. What? I look around. Behind me, to the side, to the front, nobody, nothing. What is happening? Who's out here chucking KFC at folk? Somebody's having a go. I don't know. I take another step and get tagged again. Pow! Hey! This time, I look up and I see him. It, her, looking down from the telephone wire. A crow cackling, waving its beak around in glee, finishing up the last of its scavenged chicken. Oh, oh, this is funny to you? Knock it off, stupid bird. But it doesn't knock it off. Even on, every single day or two, I get bombed, chicken bones. Rocks, buttons, it knows me, waits for me, targets me. Every time when I least expect it, something gross plops on me from the sky. Stop it! And then, 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 then it tries to drop a steaming dump on me. Misses by just a hair and I lose it. No! No, you didn't! Come here! Come here! Come down here! Come down here right now! Come here! Of course, right then, the neighbor opens her door, looks, sees me screaming at the sky, and she shuts her door again. No, 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 I'm not, I'm, it's this bird. I swear, the bird's out to get me. It's the bird! Bird! It's the bird. Play and snap judgment. Bonkers. Amazing stories from people pushed too far. And what happens when the joke is on you? My name is from Washington. Riddle me this. Is a crow that eats Kentucky fried chicken a cannibal? I say yes. Yes. And you're listening. Listen, listen, listen. To Snap Judgment. Now, we begin May 1989. Riley Knopp is about 40 years old, living in North Carolina, and he's got a great side hustle going. And I should let you know that this is a real situation. And the real people in this real story use 
real strong language. See, what folk do is they call Brian's home phone and they ask Brian to come and shear their sheep. And this is the story of one of those calls. Brian, take it away. I've been shearing professionally for four years. I always like to work with animals. I've logged with mules and worked with draft horses. Uh, but the first time I smelled what a, a shorn sheep smelled like with that lanolin, if you take much of the coconut smell away from Hawaiian Tropic and mix it with like a honey nut and a vanilla smell, that's what it smells like. I was hooked. I came home and heard all the phone calls and messages. He says, that's how you found out about your prospective clients. They left messages. And there was this guy. Hey, this is Dwayne Bagwell. I live in Harris. You probably don't even know where that is. Well, I'm down here in Rutherford County, near South Carolina border. And when I heard this voice, I first thought it was Ross Perot. Like, hell, we got sheep everywhere. They're just hard to spot because they're all wrapped up in kudzu. And it never stops. It goes on and on. I had two sheep fall into my pond. They soaked up every bit of water. That was the first message, because you know those old machines, you had a limit? Yeah, he ran, he ran the limit on his first call. And then as soon as you press the next call, it's like, hey, it's me again. The fellow down in Rutherford County with the two-ton sheep. And he said, shear 30-some sheep. Come on down. You won't have to catch them. Just shear them. It's an easy job. You get weird calls and if you bail on them you, you're not gonna share many sheep maybe he was just tired maybe he was drunk but i figured what the hell i'm shearing down that way anyway so i called him back and set the shearing date and i went the next day i sheared two farms before him drove probably another 30 minutes and i went to his place and the farms are getting less and less attractive and developed and you're starting to see broken down outbuildings. So I drive up this lone hard red clay road and all of a sudden you come to a big black mailbox that's crooked with white loopy letters that says Bagwell, his last name. There was this man standing by a jeep. This guy was in his 60s. If you took a, a stocky John Denver and you hit him on the head with a baseball bat and shortened his head and then gave him a really deep sunburn and chrome aviator glasses and a little toothbrush mustache and put a John Deere hat on him, that's Dwayne Bagwell. I said, are you Mr. Dwight, Mr. Bagwell? And he says, I am. And I bet dollars to donuts, you're the sheep shear. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, sir, sir, don't call me, sir. I was a sergeant. He asked me, where are you from, boy? And since I moved to North Carolina in 87 from Texas, I said, Texas. Big mistake. Texas? You a Texan? That means you think you're pretty tough. Well, I'm pretty tough, too, and I'll kill the first son of a bitch that thinks I... And he pulls out a 38 pistol. He didn't point it at me, but it did irritate me, so I said, put that damn thing away or I'm gone. I mean, I'm not saying that I'm tough or cool, it's just... Living in the southeast, in particular the mountains of western North Carolina, there's guns everywhere. It'd be like me getting upset if someone lit a cigarette in a city. So he put the gun away, and he just, ha, 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 yeah, I was just funning you. I thought Texans love guns. Guns, bad steak, jalapeno peppers, and titty bars. I'll open the gates for you. And so he seemed to calm down a little bit. Then I saw it. I saw what the place where I was going to be shearing He'd used barbed wire, hog wire, old wooden pallets on their end tied together to make this little paddock that's about 100 by 100. This paddock had a little storage shed, about an area as big as a pickup truck, and that was the sheep barn where he wanted me to shear. And I just, I remember thinking, this is going to hurt. These were big sheep, and there's a condition of sheep called a scour which is basically like a sheep diarrhea. So the sheep were green 
from like their stomach back over to their hindquarters and tail. And your imagination can now run wild what that would be like shearing that animal. And it was very, very hot. And there wasn't a cloud in the sky. And I'm like, they can't throw that wool off. They will overheat and they will die. They need to be shorn even though they were nasty. You have to shear sheep or they die in the southeast. Can I swear on a podcast? I thought I'm fucked. So I walked over to that little barn and I set up my equipment when he walked into the corral to start, quote, catching sheep. I told him to bring the ram first. You start with the ram because they're usually the biggest, toughest, and the hardest to shear of a flock. So while you're fresh and strong and you've got all your combs and cutters in good shape, go bring me your worst case scenario. I'm busy uh, setting up my gear and all of a sudden I hear, yeah, 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 sheep. And I hear gunshots. And I turn and look and there he was running around this pen with a lasso and his pistol in the air and he was panicking these sheep who began to run in different circles and tangents and smack into the fence and into each other and jump over farm implements and tractor discs while this lone guy is running after them and he actually snared the ram he snagged it with a rope And the ram pulled him like a water skier is pulled by a boat. He just went sailing around, kicking up dust all around. In any other context, I would have pissed myself laughing. The ram doubled its body around and rammed that little ramshackle building and broke the planks of the siding. He ran at Dwayne Bagwell and knocked him down. It was smashing everything. It broke the fence. It broke into the side of this building, broke the siding down. I've sheared rams over 200 pounds, never one that enraged. But ultimately, he got close enough to it to shorten up on the rope. He brought the ram to me so I could take my thumb and make a ring of your thumb and your first finger, pass it through the sheep's mouth in that space between the teeth, hold the head, and tuck my hand under the tail, and, and now I got him. Now it's up to me. I flipped the ram onto the ground, and then the shearing was on, but he was still kicking and snorting and, and rolling around, and you know, it was like a ground fighting, an MMA or something. So Dwayne Bagwell, I thought he would, would go and maybe get another sheep, right? But as I sheared the ram, he pulled this little chair from nowhere and sat on it and put his head right pretty much under my ass and lit a cigarette and then talked. Yeah, boy, that ram has a pair on him, don't he? Wish I had a set like that. By this time, I was in this almost non-verbal mode of get it done survive this day and that was pretty much my mantra i was already soaked completely through and this was only the very first sheep i had 29 more to go hey tex tell me something how come all the texas boys but you got girly names sheep after sheep after sheep hey now you ever hold the tip of your tongue and say cowboys lasso try it with that kind of voice there's something about it this man would talk in his sleep, talk in my sleep, talk inside his coffin, talk inside my coffin. And he kept that up for 29 more sheep. For a minute, he butted me good. If he'd had horns, I'd be singing the high parts in the church choir. Hell, I'd have his damn stuff. I was going down, dude. I got dehydrated. My muscles started to cramp. Because you're upside down in a way, your head is lower than your waist when you shear. Your sweat runs into your eyes and then it has no place to go and it kind of cooks there. Your eyes are fiery red and the salt crystallizes so it looks like, you look like margarita glasses were put onto your eyes. And in fact, at one point a vulture flew over me 
I was kind of charmed, like, hey, they really do know when you're going to die. I mean, he's, they said, that boy ain't going to make it. And I, I don't fault him at all. When I finally shut off the machine, it's hyper quiet. Hell, even he shut up. And we just looked out, and there they were. These beautiful white creatures that looked like Dr. Seuss creatures with the little whippy tails, and they were all happy. And the ram was standing, looking majestic, like, look at all my girls here. It was a pretty scene. This is why I did this. And then he goes, well, I'll go get your money. So then he just jumps in his Jeep and drives away. And I'm, I'm standing there like, is he going to come back? Am I going to get paid 90 bucks for four and a half hours? I was taking my equipment off and I couldn't unclench the nail that held that sort of gallows pole that hold my shearing. So that's when I went in the shed to see why it was held up. And I saw these like shelves and they had all these boxes. And the boxes said DuPont, and they were all filled with dynamite, with, with the nitroglycerin oozing out like the way you would squeeze a tube of glue. I was so tired, and it, that day was bad enough, and then to realize that a, a ram had been battering this little ramshackle building. Ram had been beaten on it. I had been beaten with a hammer, and this guy had dynamite. I could have been blown to smithereens. And that's when... My mind shut down. He did come back, gave me a $100 bill at the end and said, yeah, I gave you $100 because them sheep were tad dingy. I didn't say anything. He said, I'll see you next year. Nope. It was even hard for me to, to drive because I had a manual shift and my legs were starting to cramp and lock up and, and I pulled on through the gate. I felt like I just, why did you do that to yourself? Most people would have said, I'm gone, but I didn't. And sure, I could talk out my ass and say, and the moral of that story is, you got to ask for dynamite before, I mean, that would be false. I couldn't say that I learned something about myself other than a capacity for pain or abuse or whatever. I'm still not sure why it happened to me, but I accept it. I was in my car and... The reports of my body were telling me, you need to hydrate and you need calories or you're going to crash this car. The first grocery store I came to, I pulled in. There were kids, they're playing, and there were teenagers, you know, pretending to fist fight and punch each other and they were flirting with a girl. When I stepped in, it all just came to a complete stop. I mean, can you imagine a, a, a human being walking into a grocery store who has got blood and manure and dark stained stuff all around his crotch and his waist, and he's sunburnt, looks like he has salty eyeglasses on, and he smells like smell that you've never smelled in your life. I didn't even speak. I walked around the store. Hell, I lied. I ran to the store to find, trying to find sustenance. And so I went in the baby food aisle, twisted open like a lid, and stuck my tongue in it. And was like, I now had like banana, honey, cracker, goo, goo shit all over my face. I didn't care. I was just sucking that stuff out of the jars and eating it, and then opening the next one. Of course I was going to pay for it. So then I'm walking down the aisle, eating baby food jars out of my elbow, and wondering why everyone was horrified, and looking at me and pulling people out of the way as I walked up. And then when I went to the conveyor to pay, I just dropped all these empty bottles on the conveyor belt. And then that's when the manager stepped up. And he just had his arms folded and looked me up and down. Hmm, son, now what have you been into? And I said, I'm a sheep shearer.
Brian Lee Knopp, thank you for telling your story. Brian is a retired private investigator and sheep shearer. He's currently working on a collection of personal essays. The original score for that story was by Renzo Gorio. It was produced by David Exley. Now, after the break, I get to rock a story of my own. Stay tuned. When you hear people speaking about race and identity, I feel like too often they switch into some sort of weird babble that is not really English. It's not really real. It's preachy, it's sanitized, or it's crazy. But on Code Switch, they speak English. Like regular people, like you would speak to your friends and to your family about things that really matter. How race and identity shape your world in surprising, funny and confusing ways. Like what makes a good race joke? Or as a premium nerd, I really dug the discussion about race in fantasy realms like Dungeons and Dragons. So often listening to this show, they say what I was only thinking or really, you know, what I wish I had been thinking if I was funny and clever. It's not about race and identity in some sanitized nowhere. They keep it real about how things work here at home. In fact, Code Switch recently did an episode of What If Your Church Doesn't Like You Back? I was like, did they grow up next to me? Listen now to Code Switch from NPR, wherever you get your podcast. Nah, not quite. What's up? Ah, sell my car in Carvana. It's just not quite the right time. Crazy coincidence. I just sold my car to Carvana. What? I told you about it two days ago. When you know, you know. You know? I'm even dropping it off at one of those sweet car vending machines and getting paid today. That's a good deal. A oh, great deal. Come on. What's your heart saying? You're right. When you know, you know. Sold. Whether you're looking to sell your car right now or just whenever feels right, go to Carvana.com and sell your car the convenient way. Terms and conditions apply. Welcome back to Snap Judgment, the bonkers episode. Okay, so fourth grade. Teacher's saying something the eternity seconds click away once every eon. So hot. So bored. Carl leans over to me. Whispers, hey, hey, this Saturday. I dare you to pee on the electric fence. I dare you too. I say right back. And I know, right then, without a shadow of a doubt, that both Carl and I will in fact pee on the electric fence running between our respective farms outside of Kingston, Michigan. This will happen. Carl never, ever backs down. Never. And Carl will never, ever see me back down either. We're farm boys. We do what we say and say what we mean. But I don't want to pee on an electric fence. It's just another one of Carl's stupid ideas. I can already hear my dad at the hospital. He did what? But there's no help for it. I got to do it. I got to. So I start thinking, what do I know about electric fences? What? And it turns out, big country that I am, I know quite a bit. See, here's the thing about electric fences you urbanites might not understand. Electric fences are only on sometimes. Farmers want it popping enough so that the cattle are scared to touch them. But you don't want to waste all your money pouring electricity into a fence after they get the message, see? So you turn it on every once in a while. And you can turn the fence up low. Or up high for the bad ombre cows that aren't making America great again. But we digress. I start thinking, I'm going to pee on the fence when it ain't on. But how to tell? I can't just ask Farmer Ted. It's his fence. Word would get back. So that afternoon I go home and I sit in front of the fence. And if you stare long enough, it's like you can tell. There's a hum in the air, a crackle. You could almost see the magnetic energy field ready, waiting. And then it stops. The pop goes out of the air. For hours I watch until I know the rhythm of the fence, the dance of the fence master. Saturday comes. I'm going first. You go later. 
I tell Carl he looks relieved. He won't be. I make a big show about how scared I am. I bend over and smell the angry wire. You gotta be crazy to pee on that. But there's nothing, no pitch, no hum, no magnetic field. It's gonna sting, Carl. I look back with fear in my eyes. Here I go, Carl. I pull trowel and let fly. And it's not just my willy that is electrocuted. A spasm of voltage sizzles my spine, the back of my brain, my liver, my kidneys. The shockage sends me 10 feet in the air, crashing down on my back, trembling, groaning foam, leaking from my eyes, my mouth, my nose. Oh, oh man! You're something special. I ain't never seen nothing like that. Man, fried. That's what you got. I can't believe you did it. Can't believe it. I even asked Ted to turn it to 10. I said there's nothing this kid won't do, and I was right. I'll tell you what. <sighs> My brain hurt. Whatever bet this is, you win. Paul, kill me if I did something crazy like that. <sighs> Look over at the fence. And the fence grins right back at me. I don't know what happened. I still don't know what happened. Either I read it wrong or it turned on right when I did my business. I don't know. But you can imagine my surprise. A few weeks ago, I turned on the TV to see two science guys announce that it's impossible Possible to get zapped from peeing on a fence. I can prove otherwise. I can. But Carl, if you're listening right now, I think it's safe to say it's your turn. break on the bonkers episode we meet a dangerous anarchist group stay tuned welcome back to snap judgment the bonkers episode now then Get ready to unsheave your broadsword. We join a notorious anarchist organization in the midst of chaos. Snap judgment. So we were at the edge of a gigantic national park in Pennsylvania. It's such a rustic place. We had kind of planned on just making like a big explosion of uh, violence and then leaving town. Malaclips was part of this violent anarchist group. The group didn't have a name or a purpose. They just wanted to cause chaos. They went from place to place, usually in rural areas where they could easily rob people and escape into the forest. In the middle of one particular heist, they spotted an old wooden tavern at the edge of the woods where they could hide and regroup. When we came into the tavern, there were two or three people in there. And it just so happened they're people that had looked at us funny earlier. We kind of had a feeling that there were people after us. And we realized that in the tavern right now is our group and these two people that don't like us, and that's it. Malaclips and his group were on the run and carrying stolen goods. They were on high alert. And when other people inside shot them suspicious looks, everything went off the rails. Fast. My friend Don, he just like looks at me and he's like, okay, now. And he just instantly starts throwing poison gases at people. Half of our group looked at him with shock, and the other half jumped in on it and immediately started attacking the other people in the tavern. When we left the tavern, two people had been robbed and one was dead. So we've got to um, kind of like kill our way out of town now before anybody realizes what's happening. 
It's getting dark. It's five o'clock in the evening at this point. It's snowing. And we're trying to keep our visibility really low. We made it to the edge of town and we started hiking into the woods. And like most of our group is in this cluster. And we've got a, one person that's like 50 feet ahead of us and one person that's like 50 feet behind us. And they're like our front and rear guard. And maybe like 40 minutes after we're into the woods, the guy behind us claps twice. They were chasing us. So Don gets this idea to leave like a false trail. He has us all like follow each other's footprints, step in each other's footprints as we go off in one direction. Meanwhile, he leaves footprints in a big circle. And then he cuts off a branch of a pine tree and and walks backwards, covering his steps as he goes. We're like an hour and a half into this chase. And I'm like, they haven't found us yet. They're not going to find us. At that moment, we see this guy emerge from the fog ahead of us. And he goes, there they are. We just, we scattered. And I ran like a couple hundred feet. And I look over my shoulder and somebody has just hit my friend Sylvia in the back. And she falls down. And then all of a sudden there's like six people around her. So I, I sprint. I sprint and I panic. If these guys find me, they're going to kill me. There's two of them, at least two of them, and there's only one of me. I don't stand a chance. So Maliclips has this idea. If he can't run, maybe he can hide. I laid down on these rocks right next to the river, and I brushed a bunch of snow onto my back, and I let the snow fall on me. And I can hear their footsteps. And if I look to the side, I can see feet, but not much more. They had just been running, and they were kind of out of breath. I could hear talking about, like, he was just here, where is he? I just sit still in the snow. They eventually give up and go away. I look at my watch, and I realize two hours has passed. I can leave the game now. He put on a small white headband, and instantly, Maliclips, the notorious anarchist and thief, changed back into being Dan Comstock, a lanky college sophomore with shoulder-length blonde hair and a big foam sword. Dan was a LARPer, a live-action role player. He'd go on long weekend retreats where everyone played along in these big fantasy come-to-life games. He'd been so committed to it that he found himself alone in the snow in the middle of the night. And the gravity of the situation slowly sinks in. And now I'm just a 19-year-old kid lost in the mountains in Pennsylvania. I realize I'm, I'm like really lost. It's now past sunset and the snow has been falling. So I've only got like 100 feet of footprints and then it's gone. I, I shout, help! I ran and I ran and I ran. I just running and screaming. I just picked a direction and kept going. I start to lose hope. I'm going to use, like, my last bit of energy to, like, climb up this big hill and see if I could see anything from there. I push my way through these, like, thorn bushes, and I make it up to the top of this hill, and it's like a big, flat field. And on the far side of the field, I see a tiny farmhouse. I'm like, oh, civilization. I'm saved. I'm out of the woods. And so I I walk over to this farmhouse. I was very conscious of that I'm dressed in this ridiculous fantasy outfit. I take off as much of my costume as I can without, like, shivering. (laughs) I put my foam sword around the corner, and I take off my cloak. And then I took a big breath, and I knocked on the door. It It was a Dutch door, and the top half of it opened. And I saw a woman in a very traditional looking blue dress and bonnet, and she was holding a candle. That took me a little while to process what I was looking at. And the first thought in my head is like, what did I wander into another LARP? And then it hits me that I'm in Amish country. I was nervous. So I said, you know, I'm, I'm lost. I'm staying at this campsite near here. And uh, could you just like point me back to where I need to go? She's like, oh my God, you were lost in the woods. That's terrible. She knew I was scared. Uh, let me wake up my, my two of my sons and they'll, uh, they'll give you a ride back. So Stephen and Levi, get two strapping Amish lads about my age, uh, get out of bed. They get on their clothes. They go out to the barn. They wake up the horse. They attach the buggy. They bring it out. And I get in the buggy with them, and they, we start to go back. 
it's like a little wooden cab with uh, with four wheels. They have rubber tires on them. And we were sitting side by side in the front of this buggy, all three of us. They were wearing brimmed hats. And I'm wearing a black cloak with a hood and leather armor with studs on it. The horse had just been woken up, so he was a little cranky. I, I think they could tell that I had never been in a horse and buggy before, and they thought that was adorable. They're like, they were really polite, and they didn't really let on that they were teasing me, but it was very, it was a little pointy. They're like, I've never been lost in the woods before. Were you scared? And it was just, it was really surreal, you know? Because I'm, I'm trying to talk to these Amish people. They're like, what were you doing in the woods? And I, like, I couldn't really explain it, you know? I was like, have you ever heard of a, a Renaissance fair? No. Have you ever heard of Dungeons and Dragons? No. And I'm like trying not to say like, well, we pretend like we don't have technology. Like we live in a different time. It's, it's funny, you know, people talk about Amish people like they're, you know, these, these bumpkins. And I, they talk about us the same way. You know, they're good at things that we're clueless about. Like, who am I to judge? You know, I just wandered through the woods with like a cape and like a foam sword. I wasn't really able to explain it to them. And so they just kind of stop asking follow-up questions at a certain point. So we pulled up to the campsite into like a little fantasy village and there are different groups of people. There are these dark elves, they have pointy ears and they have dark makeup. Wizards who are wearing robes or, you know, and funny hats. Rangers, who, you know, kind of dressed like Robin Hood a lot of the time with the kind of like pointed cap. As soon as I stepped in, my friend Don and my friend Alan, who was carrying the treasure chest, they were like, there he is. And everybody kind of cheered. Everybody was relieved. Everybody was worried about where I had been. They said, where were you? And I said, Amish country. I thanked Stephen and Levi very warmly. I gave them hugs. They seemed a little bit amused. They were looking around and weren't really sure what they were looking at, but they, they were happy I got to where I needed to go. I kind of got that sense too, like that the next day they were going to be telling everybody, we met the weirdest guy last night. My name is Malaclips. I'm a madman, a revolutionary in the world of Tira, on the continent of Avalon, in the kingdom of Evendar, in the duchy of Greyhorn. This is a this is a land of order and chaos. There are liches and death knights, vampires, uh, werewolves. One of the werewolves is a baron, and he rules part of Greyhorn. Thank you, Dan Comstock, for the fantastical tale. Now, Dan's been organizing LARPing events for decades now. Even though Malclips the Anarchist is retired, Dan only plays the hero now. Don't get lost chasing anybody, Dan. The original score was by Renzo Gorio, and that piece was produced by Jasmine Aguilera. What a show. If you missed even a moment, know that the Snap Judgment Storytelling Podcast awaits your listening pleasure. More episodes than you can shake a stick at or walk the Shadowlands with our evil twin podcast, Spook, stories about the things that go bump in the night or amazing tales from the African continent from Mind Your Own with Lupita Nyong'o, all available wherever you get your podcast. Snap Storytelling, rub it. All over your body, it feels so good. KQED in San Francisco is SNAP's orbiting hall of justice. SNAP is brought to you by the team that has never, not once, had to hide on a window ledge like what happens in every single sitcom ever made. Except, of course, for the Uber producer, Mr. Mark Ristich, who is actually something of a window ledge connoisseur. Now there's Nancy Lopez, Pat Masidi Miller, Anna Sussman, Renzo Gorio, John Fasil, Shana Sheely, Teo Ducat, Flo Wiley, Bo Walsh, Marissa Dodge, David Exame, and Regina Bediaco. And this is not the news. No way is this the news. In fact, your neighborhood, Jerk Crow, could bully you for years on the sly. And your neighbors and friends could universally take the crow side in your ongoing dispute and you would still, still 
not be as far away from the news as this is, but this is PR. <laughs>